Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Katrina. I'm with the Michigan Opioid Collaborative. Um, so today we have Dr. Sheba Sethi and Melissa DeMars presenting for us. Um, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative has committed to doing a monthly webinar series. So we hope everyone will join us for more webinars in the future. Everyone will be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Also, if everyone could sign into the chat that with their name and email address, um, so we know who's attending, that would be great. Um, also, if you'd like to receive more information on future webinars, you can indicate that also. Um, and for those of you who would like social work CEUs, I will be posting the link in the chat box. Um, so please complete the survey as soon as possible to get credit. Um, and the survey will also redirect you to the certificate at the end. I'm just going to, I'm gonna pop up a slide, give a brief introduction about the Michigan Opioid Collaborative. And I seem to have lost my slide. There we go. So, Michigan Opioid Collaborative um, provides same-day consultation services with physicians who specialize in the use of um, medication for opioid use disorder. Um, we also provide um, technical support for clinic setup. Um, we host monthly webinars on a variety of topics around substance use. Um, we also provide um, Hep C services and other educational um, information around substance use. Um, and also a, your local behavioral health consultant will be reaching out to you after the webinar today. And if you need more information on the Michigan Opioid Collaborative or have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to them. So I'm sharing my screen. Um, so now I'm just going to introduce our presenters for today. Um, Shiva Sethi is an MD. She attended Drexel University College of Medicine and completed her residency at Montefiore Primary Care and Social Medicine Program in the Bronx, New York. She currently works as an addiction physician with the Michigan Opioid Collaborative and sees patients via telehealth at Bright Heart Health. Melissa DeMars is a licensed professional counselor and a certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor. She graduated with her Master's of Arts in Counseling Psychology from Trinity International University and has been working in the behavioral health field for over 14 years. Melissa has also worked as a behavioral health consultant for the Machine Opioid Collaborative for three years and has provided counseling support services for Marquette Family Medicine's MAT program since November of 2019. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Sheba and Melissa. Thank you, Katrina. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. So thanks everyone for being here. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us for our presentation on connection between trauma and substance use disorder and delivering trauma-informed care. I believe both Dr. Sethi and I are very passionate about this topic and are happy to be sharing with you today. Uh, neither Dr. Sethi nor I have any dis uh, disclosures to announce. So the objectives for today's presentation will be to define trauma and review uh, different types of trauma, uh, and also to review a study done on the breadth of exposure to adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and chronic household dysfunction and the relationship to disease and health risks behavior in adulthood. We will also discuss how trauma and ACEs affect physical, psychological, and relational functioning and increase the risk of developing a substance use disorder. And finally, we will increase understanding of trauma-informed care. So the definition of trauma is broad because trauma is defined by a person's subjective experience to it rather than the trauma itself. So SAMHSA's definition reads, individual trauma results from an event, series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. It is an almost universal experience of people with mental and substance use disorders. So 
I think that what we need to really focus on here is the experience, um, how the individual labels assigns meaning to and is disrupted physically and psychologically will contribute to whether or not they develop acute or lasting trauma. Trauma can be directly experienced. It can occur through witnessing in person an event occurring to others. Uh, learning that traumatic event has occurred to a close family member or close friend and experiencing repeated extreme exposure to aversive details of the traumatic event. When one is traumatized, they experience a threat to their life, their sanity, or the ability to have autonomy over their body, and they feel psychologically, physically, and emotionally overwhelmed. Trauma can affect individuals and families across a lifespan, regardless of gender, race, or ethnicity, or socioeconomic standing. And there are various biopsychosocial and cultural factors that influence an individual's immediate response and long-term reactions to a trauma, which we will review shortly. So trauma types. Um, single event trauma is often unexpected, shocking, and produces feelings of horror. It is often associated with the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Examples would be um, being a victim of violent assault, a victim of mugging or robbery, uh, witnessing a terrorist attack or a military combat accident. Repeated trauma, there are multiple or repetitive traumas happening to the same person over time. Um, this is often a, a part of an interpersonal relationship where one feels trapped emotionally or physically. Um, this could be childhood abuse, domestic violence, bullying at home, work or school, or emotional neglect. Um, it can al also be numerous unrelated events. So a person assaulted during their adolescence, loss of a loved one in their 30s, and then involved in a major accident later in life. Chronicity of trauma breaks down resiliency and the ability to adapt. So there's a breakdown of physical and psychological functioning that can lead to mental illness and or substance use disorder. Complex trauma are events that typically happen early in life and affect the child's development and ability to form secure attachments. The person causing the trauma is often a caregiver. These events are invasive and occur in the formative years, affecting an individual's ability to cope and function normally as they get older. And I can say working with people in the role of a counselor, uh, working with people with serious mental illness and substance use disorders, the majority of those patients report complex trauma. So they experience trauma in the context of their family throughout their childhood and adolescence. And so it was very pervasive. And then we have historical and collective and intergenerational trauma. And this is psychological or emotional trauma that can affect different communities, cultural groups, and generations. So examples would be racism, slavery, forced removal from a family or a community, genocide, and war. So these are just some examples of traumatic situations, events, or circumstances. For many of us, when we hear the word trauma or the diagnosis of PTSD, we often think of assault or witnessing a terrorist attack like 9-11. And these situations are certainly traumatic and can cause short and long-term trauma reactions, but they aren't necessary for a person to develop trauma. What I think is important to highlight here is less tangible examples like unsafe, unpredictable environment. Um, so, or, or examples that people would, would think wouldn't cause trauma. Um, so an example of an unsafe, unpredictable environment would be a child who grows up in a household with a caregiver who struggles with mental illness, and that child experiences quick changing mood and functioning of the caregiver. And so they might, they just don't know what they're going to get, and they might be at a constant uh, level of dis-ease and feeling unsafe. Um, it could also be a child who experiences parents divorcing and senses that both parents are struggling with significant stress. Um, and there's potentially an absence of one parent uh, or the child is faced with switching households. And then another unpredictable unsafe environment could also be a situation where an adult is being bullied or mistreated in the workplace and feels unable to change the situation or leave the job. 
So how common is trauma? Trauma is incredibly prevalent. Studies estimate 70 to 90% of people in the United States have a lifetime history of exposure to at least one traumatizing event. National surveys indicate the rate of child mistreatment is 25.6% and the rate of sexual assault in childhood is 4%. And the CDC's, uh, CDC's survey found that one in three women and one in four men have experienced rape, intimate physical violence, or stalking in their lifetime. Next slide. Okay, so now let's look at the neurobiology um, with trauma. So at the top of the slide, you see an early life stressor. This is, you know, usually an ongoing stressor, but could be, you know, a one-time big, big event. And then we, we see how that can impact, directly impact the CNS. And I'm sorry, that's, it's not defined on here, but CNS stands for central nervous system or the brain. These direct impacts on the central nervous system can um, result in structural changes observed in the brain. Things like an increase or decrease in the volume of the hippocampus and an increase in the volume of the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. A structural change is really, um, a reaction to whatever the stressor is. So depending on the trauma the child is experiencing, we would expect to see different structural changes in the brain. There's also dysregulated stress systems. So this is, this is due to a disruption of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which regulates our stress hormones. And so this inappropriate neuroendocrine response can in turn affect CNS development and functioning. And all this with the background of a, you know, a person's genetics can lead to a pathology. Next slide, please. So this, this picture shows the brain areas implicated in post-traumatic stress disorder. So we have on the left here, the prefrontal medial prefrontal cortex. This is responsible for executive functioning, things like personality, abstract thinking, planning, and behavior regulation. We then see the amygdala, and this is really critical in the development of a fear response and our emotional responses, other emotional responses. And then we have the hippocampus, which is really the center for memory and learning. And so um, in, in PTSD, we, we see often, we often see an overreactive amygdala and so many patients can't determine um, a mild stressor from an actual threat. So things like a slamming door could make them, um, you know, jump up and be very surprised. So, and, and we, we call, clinically, we call, we call that hypervigilance. We also see that their amygdala have less connectivity with the, the front prefrontal cortex. And so this is, this, we relate this to a lot of the emotional um, dysregulation we see or, and beho behavioral dysregulation subsequently. So, you know, dysregulation and structural changes, poor communication between all these areas um, can contribute to disruptions in a patient's emotional response, but also their motivational and reward pathway, because these areas are also directly implicated in. Um, and substance use disorder. And so, you know, this is really how these, you know, you can see clearly how these patients are more vulnerable to a substance use disorder when the same areas of the brain are affected. Next slide. Um, I wanna to briefly touch on um, our stress responses. So um, when someone without PTSD is exposed to a stressor, you have a fight or flight response. And so what you have is a, is a physiologic increase in your stress hormones. And then once, you know, the stressor has passed, um, your stress hormones decrease and go back to, you know, whatever's normal for you. People with PTSD and maladaptive um, responses to trauma will have an increased response in their stress symptoms to milder stressors. And then those stress hormones will stay elevated for a long time. And again, we see this as hypervigilance. They also have a third type of response, which is a freeze response. Um, and the freeze response can clinically manifest as shutting down and failing to engage in the present. And clinically, we, we refer to this as dissociation. 
I think there's a lot of definitions of dissociation, but I'd like to share um, one definition I, I particularly like. Dissociation is feeling lost, overwhelmed, abandoned, and disconnected from the world. You see, your, you see oneself as unloved, empty, helpless, trapped, and weighed down. And so patients with this maladaptive trauma response spend a lot of energy suppressing their past or avoiding their past instead of living in the moment. Next slide. So trauma is unique to everyone. Uh, trauma in childhood development affects neurodevelopment. Uh, sorry, tra trauma in childhood affects neurodevelopment and can result in a child being unable to master cognitive, emotional, and social skills expected for their developmental age. The intensity, frequency, duration of threatening events or circumstances uh, has a significant impact on the development of trauma. So was this one event repeated or complex trauma? Was the trauma directly experienced or was it witnessed or heard about? Who is responsible for the trauma? And what happened after? Was there loss of a loved one, loss of employment, loss of assets or finances? And then was there time to process? So this is probably one of the most important resources and the least resource allowed to us. And the body in a single event, the body and mind uh, need time to process through the emotions, through the physical manifestations of the emotions, and people need to process out loud their experience as soon as possible. For a loss of a loved one or pervasive trauma, people need time, we need time. And we need to be able to, once we return to our roles in life, we still need to be able to have time to process that uh, with somebody safe or a qualified professional. Um, and then was there disruption to a person's sense of self? You know, their sense of meaning of themselves, of the world, of others. Um, was there a disruption to their core beliefs or faith? This will be very uh, important in, in how severe this trauma becomes. Um, what kind of coping skills do the person have before the trauma and what skills do they have now? Uh, one thing I think that it's important to mention here is a person's temperament. Some people are just highly sensitive and feel things more viscerally. They're very aware of other people's energies and emotional reactions or behaviors towards them. Um, highly sensitive people are at greater risk for trauma and sometimes they find it difficult to employ coping skills because they're, um, they're so hyper aroused. Um, does the individual have meaningful relationships or a sense of belonging to a group larger than them? Uh, knowing they have safe people who will offer unconditional support. And then access to community resources, access to health resources, behavioral health services, faith-based services, or safe social activities. So here are some yes. of the symptoms of trauma. Um, people who experience trauma can have difficulty concentrating, memory problems, a lack of motivation, difficulty re regulating emotions, including irritable behavior, angry outbursts, impulsive behavior, a loss of belief or sense of self, flashbacks, which are recurrent, intrusive, distressing memories of the event, nightmares and insomnia, efforts to avoid thoughts and activities, feeling flat, hyperarousal, a sense of impending doom, and feelings of detachment. Next slide, please. And so I wanted to touch uh, here on post-traumatic stress disorder. Trauma is an event Post-traumatic stress disorder is a DSM-5 diagnosis. There are other stress-related diagnoses in the DSM-5. Um, and I didn't, I didn't include the full criteria here because it's very long, but to summarize, um, PTSD may be diagnosed when a, a person ex with a history of traumatic, usually ongoing traumatic events, result in a constellation of symptoms, including negative changes in mood, dissociation, unwanted memories or thoughts, avoidance, and a state of hyperarousal. And, you know, these symptoms really need to affect the person in all aspects of their life. 
So patients can meet criteria for the diagnosis of PTSD and not have memory of the traumatic event, which obviously poses a diagnostic challenge. And the prevalence in the general population is thought to be six to some studies say as high as 9%. But we know that certain populations are at, um, have, have a much higher prevalence. So it's more common in women. And it's also, um, you know, among people with substance use disorders, the lifetime prevalence is thought to be between 26 and 52%. So I think that's a staggering figure. Um, you can have some symptoms of trauma, which I shared with you on the last slide, and not be diagnosed with PTSD. But some studies estimate that people with um, substance use disorder have diagnosed PTSD ha half of the time. And so we'll keep that in mind as we review, um, we'll review the, the, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Next slide. So in summary, the impact of trauma, trauma causes impaired development. It causes people to become limited and constricted in their capacity to respond to the world. People with trauma are often disconnected from their own feelings, develop a view of the world that's tinted by pain or distrust, and they lose their sense of security. The body's physical resources are depleted with chronic stress, leaving people susceptible to illness and injury. And then trauma has a significant impact on relationships because trauma disrupts an individual's relationship with themselves. So a person with trauma often feels unsafe, uh, has a fear of being vulnerable, might expect betrayal in relationships, is emotionally dysregulated, especially during conflict, and has an inability to effectively communicate and resolve conflict. And you can kind of see the ripple effect here because if people have trouble with relationships because of trauma, then that affects them having a support system or forming and keeping relationships that would have a, a, allow them to have a good primary support system or more extended social support system. So we'll look uh, now at the study on adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. So this study was a collaboration between the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, um, started in 1995, 1997. Over 17,000 people were asked to complete confidential surveys about whether or not they experienced an adverse childhood experience before the age of 18. Um, seven categories of adverse childhood experiences were studied, uh, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, and then chronic household dysfunction where a caregiver may have had a mental illness, may have been incarcerated, uh, may have had a substance use disorder, mom was treated violently, or there was a uh, parent's divorce. So the relationship between the number of ACEs an individual reported and physical and behavioral health outcomes in adults, such as substance use, mental health disorders, stroke, cancer, heart disease, et cetera, were measured. So for people that reported four ACEs or greater have a four to 12 fold increase in health risks for alcoholism, drug misuse, depression, and suicide attempt, a two to four fold increase in smoking, poor self-rated health, greater than or equal to 50 sexual intercourse partners, sexually transmitted disease, and a 1.4 to 1.6 fold increase in physical inactivity and severe obesity. So let that data just really sink in for a minute. This is critical information for prevention, treatment, and recovery from serious mental illness or a substance use disorder. And treatment behavioral health clinicians work to create competency and resiliency in individuals by helping them learn how to manage emotions, tolerate and effectively manage distress help them learn effective interpersonal skills and increase self-awareness. In recovery, we help them maintain and build these skills. So in prevention, it's critical to build these, these skills in our kids and adolescents. So this um, graphic is on ACEs and life expectancy. People with uh, who reported six or more ACEs died nearly 20 years earlier on average than those without ACEs. And I think this figure is, it's just that statistic is staggering. And this is a really nice graphic representation of, of that difference um, 
in you know expected life expectancy. So I think this really speaks to um, how ACEs affects all aspects of people's health. Next slide, please. So what about ACEs and um, substance use disorders? So we know from this study, from the landmark study, that four or more uh, patients with or a score of four or more on their ACEs are seven times more likely to develop an alcohol use disorder, five times more likely to use illicit drugs, and 10 times more likely to inject drugs. So in summary, um, patients with you know more adverse childhood experiences have greater risks of substance use disorder. And we know from the earlier slides that patients with substance use disorder have um, high rates of PTSD. And so I'm sure it's not news to anyone who's listening today that many people use drugs to self-medicate from many of the symptoms that, that they experience from trauma, like hypervigilance, flashbacks, anxiety. And so I think this really speaks to the importance of getting the patient with a patient with substance use disorder um, to a place where they can address their traumatic past. Next slide. Okay, so the landmark ACEs study that Melissa just reviewed with you was from, was in the mid nineties. And it actually um, had a predominantly white middle-class and financially secure population. And so I'd like to present more recent data um, with a more heterogeneous population. So this study reviewed something called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System data, um, which is done in every state, but 25 states asked questions about adverse childhood experiences. Of note, they only asked about eight of the 10 that were asked in the original study. They didn't ask about neglect. So 25 states um, included those questions in their questionnaire, their telephone-based survey. Um, and this, you know, this data was from the years 2015 to 2017, and they had a sample size of over 214,000 people. And their results really replicated what has been, had been found. Uh, they were very similar to what has been found since the previous study. The ACEs score, ACEs were still very prevalent. 60% of the respondents had a score of one, 25% had a, a score of at least three or more. The ACEs score was also disproportionately higher in people of color, people who did not complete a high school education, people who were unemployed and disabled, people who were LGBTQ+, people who were lower income. And so thinking back, you know, thinking about the social determinants of health, we know that these groups are also at higher risk for those. And so we don't, I don't think this, I think, you know, I think we should, I think that's a point to reflect on. So this study actually uh, argues in their discussion that adverse childhood experiences are a huge public health burden. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote from the discussion section of the study now. Preventing adverse childhood experiences could have broad positive health, social, and economic impacts. For example, preventing adverse childhood experiences could potentially decrease the number of people with coronary artery disease, the leading cause of death in the US. It could decrease the number of persons with coronary artery disease by up to 12.6%. To, to Next slide. So what can we do? So what is trauma-informed care? Trauma-informed care begins with the understanding that, um, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to be so fancy. Thank you. <laughs> Um, trauma-informed care begins with the understanding that, of trauma and its lasting effects on individuals. And so while I was preparing for this presentation, I started to think about my training where we learned, you know, we really had the model of patient-centered care. Patient-centered care, I think, trauma-informed care, I think, is a subset of patient-centered care. In patient-centered care, the emphasis is on shared decision-making the patient is in charge of their treatment and the patient, we really center on the patient's agenda. Um, I did my training in the, in the Bronx and there were very high rates of um, you know, trauma, substance use disorders, and also distrust of the medical system. And so this, this was the patient-centered care was the first thing that we learned about. 
because if we can't get the patients to engage with us and to trust with trust us, then you know we can't really do anything else. And I also put harm reduction up here because I think it ties in nicely with um, both of these care models. Harm reduction is focused on minimizing harmful outcomes and celebrating positive change. Next slide. So here's a nice graphic about, you know, really a systems approach to trauma-informed primary care. You want to focus on these things and the environment. It should be calm, safe, and empowering for both patients and staff. Screening, you know, a systematic way to screen for current and lifelong abuse, PTSD, depression, and substance use. And then response, you know, if you don't have on-site resources, that's okay, but knowing where you can refer to in the community, programs that you know are promote safety and healing. And if, if you don't know um, where to refer to in your community, you can always call us at the Michigan Opioid Collaborative and we can help you. And then really the foundation, which you know I wanna highlight here, it also includes support for providers. Next slide. So a trauma-informed approach includes four Rs. One realizes, realize the potential, the widespread impact of trauma and understand the potential paths for recovery. Two, recognizes, recognizes signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, families, staff, and others involved with the system. Three, responds, responds by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices. And four, resists, seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. Next slide, please. So let's use a case to, you know, illustrate these four R's. So we, we have FM, a 25-year-old single male. He lives with his mother, and he recently lost his job as a mechanic. He comes in seeking treatment for an opioid use disorder with his primary care physician. And during the intake, the patient reports a history of childhood trauma, domestic violence between parents, parents using illicit drugs, father leaving when um, FM was nine, and mother's substance use subsequently increased. And then also he reports a history of emotional abuse and neglect. So if we want to count up his ACE score, we would give him one point for domestic violence, one point for drug use in the home, one point for his father leaving, a point for emotional abuse, and a point for neglect. So his score would be five. Next, please. So, Realize using our trauma informed care approach, we know that patients with a history of addiction have high rates of traumatic experiences, and we assess for trauma as part of a complete history. This is this can be difficult to do. Um, it takes time. It can be triggering, and it also can be therapeutic. So I think the key is really to allow the patient to share as much detail as they feel comfortable sharing. And in terms of evidence based recommendations, the U.S. Preventative Task Force. Um, recommends screening all women of re reproductive age for intimate partner violence, and it's a B-grade recommendation, but I'm not aware of any other, you know, really evidence-based um, recommend recommended, um, you know, trauma screening. Next slide. So here is an outline of a way that you could approach a trauma history screening. Um, I'm not going to I'm not gonna read this, um, but it's it's there um, if you need it. I think the I think what the one point I wanna highlight is I think it's really difficult to assess for childhood emotional abuse um, and, and to some degree neglect because normal is relative. So so if the patient grew up in a household where that was all that they knew, um, then you know they might not recognize that that is what they experienced. I think that's one aspect of it, but I think there's also this other aspect of, of um, you know, caregiver relationships being important to people, um, and so there's a sense of loyalty as well. And I want to offer an um, example from one of my patients. I think that illustrates this point. So I had a patient who told me that she didn't have a great relationship with the mother, mother, but her mother was still in her life and watched her kids. But then one day when, you know, she came in for her clinic visit, she told me that she loved coming to see me because I was the only person in her life 
that said, that told her positive things about herself. And so, you know, thinking back, um, you know, it's not, she had a caregiver that, that really just only told her negative things about herself. And I think this, we can see how this affected her in her present day life because the same patient had um, a boyfriend who with, she had children. So the, you know, she was, she, she broke up with him. She was trying to break up with him. Um, but he would come over to see the children and they would continue to have sexual intercourse. And so I, you know, I asked her how that was going because she was very clear in her desire to not have him in her life romantically. And she then told me that, um, that when they had sexual intercourse, he would usually physically overpower her, but she didn't want to have sex with him. And she had such a low sense of, she had such little self-esteem and such a low sense of self that she didn't, she didn't recognize that as an assault. And so, you know, that we, you know, we discussed that with her. And then the next time, you know, he came over and tried to physically force himself on her. She told him, you're raping me. And that made him stop and leave and the, the behavior stopped. So I think that exploring this with our patients can potentially be extremely therapeutic um, for many aspects of their life. Next slide. Okay, realize screening. So I know that um, whatever setting we practice in, the, this sort of uh, intake takes a lot of time and so we might not be afforded the luxury of you know, really having the time and space to do um, a thoughtful and thorough trauma history. And so here are two uh, questionnaires that you could also use. One is the original 10, 10 question ACEs questionnaire. And the other one is um, something called the stressful life experience screen, which is a 13 question screen. Next slide. So back to our case. With the provider, our patient is distressful, guarded, and he provides short answers to questions. He has poor eye contact, bounces knee rapidly, fidgeting. He appears to be in opioid withdrawal, elevated heart rate, sweaty, and he tells us he's very uncomfortable. So using a trauma-informed care approach, we just sort of shorten the intake, send him a prescription for a medicine that can make him feel better and do a short follow-up in three days. Next slide. So respond. Um, so here I think is what's key here is to make the patient feel as comfortable as we can in whatever our setting is. You know, introduce yourself, explain your role, ask how we can make the patient more comfortable, communicate what you're going to do and what your plan is for the visit and let them know that if they're uncomfortable, they can always tell us that they want to stop. Next slide. I wanted to just touch on the physical exam here because I think this is a really an important place for our patients with trauma. They, you know, obviously a physical exam can be very triggering for patients who've had physical and sexual trauma. So, you know, I, I would say allow the patient to just rope to their level of comfort. And this could even be a systems approach. Um, you know, maybe the, the people rooming the patients can always say that to the patient. You know, instead of the, you know, get undressed and the provider will be in soon, you could have, you know, the clinic say adopt language that's more similar to disrobe to your level of comfort. Obtain consent before each part of the exam. Um, but I would say maybe even just obtain consent to do an exam. When I finish my histories, I say, may I now do a physical exam? And I have had patients say no a few times, but usually what I get is, why else am I here? So that happens too. And then just explain what you're doing throughout the exam. Now I'm gonna listen to your lungs. Can you please take some deep breaths in and out? Um, now I'm gonna listen to your heart, um, you know, that kind of thing. And then frequently check in, how are you doing? I think um, another point in the physical exam that can be very difficult is a pelvic exam in patients with sexual trauma. And so um, I like to, you know, talk to the patient about what, what to expect in the pelvic exam at a separate visit before we plan to do it. Um, many, many of the patients have never had a pelvic exam. Um, so, you know, I pull out the speculum, I show it to them, I walk them through every step of the exam using my hands and showing them like, you know, exactly what I'm doing and explaining why I'm doing it. Um, and then, you know, 
we usually schedule the exam and I, you know, the patients can bring someone with them if that makes them more comfortable um, or things like that. And then during the exam too, you know, the pelvic exam, just, you know, make sure the patient knows if, if they want to stop at any time we stop. And so sometimes, you know, we, we would, you know, get the patient ready and they don't, you know, I'd say, okay, can you just let your knees fall? And the patient would say, nope, nope, we're done. So then we just have to try again. Okay, next slide, please. So back to our case, FM returns to the next visit. He's no longer in opioid withdrawal. He's more conversant. He thanks our office staff and clinicians for, for their time. And over time, we learn that he decided to seek treatment after his best friend overdosed and died in his arms. FM had tried unsuccessfully to revive him with naloxone and he blames himself for his friend's death. If I had called for help, I know he'd still be here with us. Um, he agrees to go to counseling and you know, trauma-related treatments, and he starts working full-time as a mechanic. Next slide. So resist re-traumatization. I think that in the healthcare setting, we, we have great intentions, but a lot of the re-traumatization is really unintentional. Um, so, you know, we just want to do our best to develop trust, allow the patient to have a voice um, and be the driver of their treatment. I think framing of, um, you know, our decisions is also our, you know, our, our recommendations is also important. So, you know, we don't want to say that we're discharging a patient or referring them to a higher level of care. And, you know, I think one way that I approach that is if, if it even crosses my mind that the patient's not doing well in an outpatient setting or a telehealth setting, I tell them, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that you're not doing well, you know, for these reasons. And maybe, you know, it would be more appropriate if you, you know, got your care at X, Y, and Z for these reasons. So really just having really transparent, open communication. You know, make appropriate referrals, know where you can refer the patient. And also, I think very importantly, you know, the maladaptive behaviors doesn't resolve the patient of personal responsibility. And it, it you know, the patient can't mistreat you or any of your staff. Um, and that's not what we're trying to say. I think setting expectations and boundaries is extremely important um, for even, you know, in the therapeutic setting, it's important for the patient in, in their journey to sort of learn more self-regulation. Next slide, please. I just wanted to give a quick example. Oh of yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, so this example would be specific to a systems approach and trauma, um, implementing trauma-informed care to the intake and assessment planning for a behavioral health facility. So a female client um, who has been court mandated to substance use disorder treatment and was raped as an adult is just is supposed to attend group therapy, but without considering the implication that for her, the fact that the only group of, at the facility is all male and there's historically a low uh, rate of female participation. So a trauma-informed response would be to recognize that placement in this group has the potential to be triggering and re-traumatize her. So uh, having a discussion among staff and with her finding alternative interventions for her to receive effective treatment. Thank you. I think that's a really great example. So what can we do? We can ask for organizational support. We can provide training and support for our staff and providers to help contextualize these patient behaviors. Arrange for extra appointment time if you can. Do our best to you know, remain calm. Someone that you've met for two minutes um, who's very angry, can't be angry at you. They just met you. And I know that we all know this, but it's really difficult to do in the moment. Um, you know, There's so much power imbalance in the healthcare setting. It's inherent to our setting, but I think just being mindful of it. And I also wanted to have a note here about witness during drug screens. I think these can be incredibly traumatizing for some of our patients with a history of trauma. And so, you know, I have a colleague who um, does random witness drug screens in his office, but he has a patient for anyone, he has an option for anyone to opt out and do an oral swab instead. And so I think, you know, thinking of Melissa's example or this example, you know, just having an, 
option for someone to not do something that makes them uncom uncomfortable is really huge. Next slide. Okay, so there's a lot of studies that show um, patients with substance use disorders and an increased ACE score, you know, they have a lot of um, the worst outcomes in terms of their substance use disorders. So things like IV drug use, overdose, relapse. But so I, when I was, I also found this study. So this study was done in one rural clinic in Tennessee, um, which is really prides itself on practicing harm reduction and a trauma informed care approach. So I'm not sure if this is, um, this patient population is really generalizable, but I wanted to include this study because um, it also found that each treatment visit for these patients with opioid use disorder reduced the odds of an opioid relapse by 2%. And so I think, you know, we've presented a lot of really, I think, depressing and heavy material today. Um, a lot of things are patients and clients go through, it's horrible. I, um, and, you know, I know that there's many difficulties getting patients the care that we know that they need and would help them. And so it can feel somewhat hopeless. But I think this statistic um, gives me hope. You know, every positive interaction with the healthcare system matters and can make a change. Um, and, you know, 2% might, you know, maybe that's not a lot, but I think over a year or several years, that 2% can add up to a whole lot. Um, and it doesn't have to be linear. So really for my patients with substance use disorder with, you know, histories of really horrific histories of trauma, my initial goal is just to get them to come back, you know? Um, and so it, I, I think, you know, in thinking of the trauma informed care approach, you know, it really, I think it really boils down to that. Next slide. So this slide is just a really nice summary of some of the key principles of a trauma-informed care approach. Safety, common areas are welcoming, privacy is respected. Choice, individuals are provided a clear and appropriate message about their rights and responsibilities. Collaboration, individuals are provided a significant role in planning and evaluating services. Trustworthiness, res respectful and professional boundaries are maintained, and I think that goes both ways. Empowerment, providing an atmosphere that allows individuals to feel validated and affirmed with each and every contact at the agency. Next slide. So we wanted to um, give some, a br briefly touch on treatment. Um, so you would wanna treat the substance use disorder and trauma simultaneously. Um, it's very important to have a strong provider client rapport. So lead with compassion and build trust. Remember, people with trauma have a really hard time trusting. So that's going to be really important. Uh, screen and assess for trauma. All uh, addiction counselors and other providers should become familiar with the diagnostic criteria for trauma and the mental illnesses that commonly co-occur with substance use disorders so that you can refer clients for a full psychiatric evaluation if needed but to tailor treatment and services. Um, you know, it is important before, you know, so they're taken through their trauma to teach grounding skills, uh, breathing techniques to keep them or you know, get them back into the moment um, if they're starting to experience uh, intense signs of trauma. Um, teaching coping skills are really important um, so that when they are processing their trauma, they have coping skills and kind of a toolbox to uh, rely on. And then this is not an exhaustive list, but these are a list of evidence-based treatments for trauma. Um, and I think the big takeaway here is that trauma is experienced physically, mentally, emotionally, and you have to treat the mind and body. Um, and so uh, talk therapy alone is not the best treatment for trauma. So in summary, childhood trauma is associated with structural and functional changes to the brain. Patients who have experienced adverse childhood events have higher rates of chronic diseases, including substance use disorder and other mental health disorders. Ask or elicit um, a history of trauma. 
It's not necessary to take a highly detailed trauma history and trauma-informed care has an emphasis on shared decision-making. So we just wanted to share some resources with you. Um, SAMHSA's uh, Treatment Improvement Protocol uh, or TIP 57 uh, is on trauma-informed care and behavioral health, and you can download it for free off their website. It has very good information on strategies that can help a behavioral health provider or organization learn and implement traumas of, or, sorry, principles of trauma-informed care. And then Provider Clinical Support Systems has a webinar, uh, what clinicians need to know about trauma, and then the GAIN Center uh, offers um, training that helps educate criminal justice professionals about the impact of trauma and how to develop trauma-informed responses. This link uh, will take you to the page to learn more about the All Day GAIN Center's training on being more trauma-informed in justice settings. It will also help identify a trainer in the area that you are in that can provide an all day training. And then Trauma-Informed Care Implementation Resource Center has so many valuable resources, webinars, journal articles, implementation guides for learning about and implementing trauma-informed approaches. And it's appropriate for a wide range of practices. So providers, health systems, organizations, and even policymakers. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative is funded uh, through Blue Cross Blue Shield, MDHHS, SAMHSA and the University of Michigan, Michigan Medicine. And at this time, we will open it up for questions. Thank you. And someone asked if they can get a copy of the PowerPoint and we can certainly make that available. And I'd also like to say thank you so much for being here. I think this is a really important topic. So as Melissa said, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. Um, and just a reminder to everyone before you sign off, if you could just make sure you put your name in, email in the chat so that we can follow up with you afterwards. So please unmute yourself or you can also um, ask your questions in the chat. Does the survey work? And I think someone said it wasn't working. I keep getting uh, the site can't be reached after I fill it out up until the submit button and then it says the site can't be reached. I'm not sure. I can, I, I can put the link in there one more time. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the problem is, but let me try maybe it one we, more time. We can contact, we can contact the site and then maybe follow up with all of you via email um, about that. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. There's a possibility it may not be working. It's not quite one o'clock, so it might be time sensitive as well. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Alyssa? Question, what would be the first step in getting trauma-informed care implemented in your care center? I think that's a great question. Um, I think if we think back to the figure I showed um, and everyone's setting is different, but what I would recommend as a first thing is a, is a whole staff training. Um, because really, if everyone has to work together, everyone has to be on the same page and um, I think it's really important that every single person in the office, you know, has some level of baseline training. What do you think, Melissa? I think, yeah, it's, you know, it is from the, the top of the organization down. So it is getting buy-in mm -hmm. from, you know, the top uh, leadership. And then, you know, SAMHSA's got a great resource on implementing trauma-informed care. I think it's really important to educate on, you know, what it is, and there's many resources for that, um, and then getting the buy-in from, from the leadership team, because really everybody at every level is trained 
uh, on what this means. And we were kind of talking about this before we started and what it looks like tangibly, like what, what are examples of, of someone uh, giving a trauma-informed response? Um, so happy to provide resources. Um, SAMHSA is a good start. And um, I think our reference page lists uh, other resources as well. But if there's any specific um, resources we can help with, please email us. I think that's a great point about getting organizational buy-in. We got another question. Is EMDR effective with telehealth? I don't know the answer to that actually. So I'm not, yeah. Do you recommend to add to talk therapy for telehealth? I think so that's I'm not question. EMDR trained, um, but I know that EMDR therapists are using um, this through telehealth. Um, and I think there's different tools that they can use. I think there's lights that they can use. Um, there's also the patient can be given, um, you know, uh, things that they can hold in, in each hand and, and it stimulates uh, different parts of the brain. But I think there might be a cost there. I'm not sure. Um, but I know it is being used through uh, telehealth. And then, um, you know, as far as through telehealth, I think that um, I know this can happen through telehealth as well as art therapy, um, dance, yoga. You might not, you may or may not do it, you know, with the therapist, but this is something that would probably be recommended. Um, and then adjunct therapies, maybe that might be available in your local area. Um, would be an option as well. I would I, say that, um, I'm sorry, did I cut you off, Melissa? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I, I don't think that there's a whole lot of um, evidence for delivering some of these um, therapies via telehealth, but I think we're in you know, a changing landscape. So hopefully we will start to see some evidence soon as, more and, as telehealth become more and more accepted. Um, we have some more questions. Is there any research in regard to racism as an ACE and its impact related to trauma? Yeah, there is. I think that's a really important structural racism is, um, is traumatizing. I mean, outside of childhood in every setting. And uh, um, I think it really impacts, um, you know, people lifelong. So yeah, but there is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of articles written on that actually. Um, and then we have a longer comment here. I was recommended the book, The Whole Brain Child. It is how to deal with the emotional child. You know what? I was recommended that book and I have it on my bookshelf, but now I'm going to read it. <laughs> I think people with trauma go back to the emotional section of their brain. And actually that's, that's a hundred percent true. So when I was um, showing the pictures of the brain and talking about the structural changes, you know, the predominantly the changes are seen on the right side of the brain, which is the more emotional side of the brain. So that's, that's, that's actually, that's totally true. People try to work, debate with the person. We need to deal with persons that have had trauma with care and concern. Yeah, meet them where they are. I like that. There's a question, can you talk about how law enforcement and incarceration affects the ability to provide trauma-informed care? Well, we know definitely that um, being incarcerated is very high risk for trauma. Um, I do believe that, you know, like, as we mentioned, there's the gain center training, um, but I, I know that there is a push to have law enforcement um, and, you know, the jails and prisons implement this as well. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's, you might be dealing with somebody coming to you out of jail or prison that has trauma very specific to being incarcerated. Um, and that would be part of the, of the treatment plan. Every setting is different. In some settings, I think it's harder to do some of these practices, more difficult to do some of these practices that we discussed today. It is very setting dependent.
Okay, if there are no more questions, it is one o'clock, so we will go ahead and wrap it up. Um, if you, um, a behavioral health consultant will be following up with everyone. So if you have any further questions, feel free to let them know. Um, you also will have um, a copy of the slide sent to you. So I believe Sheba and Melissa's emails are in there so you can reach out to them directly also um, if there are any further questions. Um, so thank you, Dr. Sefi and Melissa, and thank you for everyone who attended. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much for being here.